as we were departing for Austria, I asked him for permission to write to his daughter to ask for her news. And on my return, I would ask for her from the emperor. And so we embraced one another. That same evening, Duvilla was on duty. I said to him, the emperor's in his bedroom. I want very much to ask him for his agreement before my departure. Duvilla said to me, yes, I would not ask for better. At least we shall rest easy. And I went in to see the emperor. He said to me, well, Rustam, what do you want? Are my weapons in good order? I said to him, yes, sire, but I have a favor to ask of your majesty. He said to me, tell me what it is. Your majesty knows the one named Duvila, who is attached to the service of the empress. He is a daughter, greatly pretty and young. She is his only daughter. I'm asking for permission to get married. He said to me, does she have a great deal of filone? That is to say, a great deal of money. I said to him, I do not believe so. I have the good fortune to belong to your majesty. I will never lack for anything. And he said to me, but we are going to depart in a few days. You will not have the time. I said to him, if your majesty says yes to me, well, it will be on our return. And he said to me, yes, I grant you it on my return. I shall have you married. I was in as happy as a king. I went immediately to see Duville. I announced the good news of our happiness to him, and he was highly content. He embraced me extremely sincerely. The next day, I paid a visit to his wife and to his daughter, who were already informed. They received me marveling, and some days later, I departed for the army. We crossed the kingdom of Wittenberg, and Bavaria and arrived in Vienna. After that, we departed for Austerlitz. It was there that the final decisive battle was fought. Three days later, Emperor Napoleon had a meeting with the Emperor of Austria. Later, we left for Schoenbrunn, one league from Vienna, a grand palace belonging to the Emperor of Austria. One day, I went to Vienna at an extremely early hour with several of my friends to have lunch. I stayed in the city until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I met a person from the household who was riding by. I asked him if there was any news. He said to me, after this morning, no news. I asked him what that news had been. Please, would you tell me? Because I know nothing, because I have been here since this morning. He said to me, Peace was signed this morning when part of the service has already departed from Munich, and the emperor will depart tomorrow in the morning. And so I was the happiest of men on account of peace for everyone and for my good fortune because I wanted so much to arrive in Paris for my marriage, as the emperor had promised me. We arrived in Munich, and the empress arrived some days later to rejoin the emperor, who was awaiting the marriage of the viceroy with the daughter of the king of Bavaria. We had every day great festivities, and the city was illuminated every night. The emperor went on several hunts with guns and with hounds. I loaded his rifles. Some days later, we went to Würzburg, where a great party was prepared for the emperor and the empress. The emperor also hunted on one time with the king of Wittenberg. During the hunt, the emperor presented the carbine, a carbine of great value to the king. As I was the gun bearer, I carried the carbine to where the king was. Some days later, we arrived in Paris. The emperor had promised to let me marry, but the chief judge and the archbishop of Paris did not want to give me permission, saying that I was not Roman Catholic. I would say to them, I'm a Georgian. The Georgians are all Christians. They did not want to listen to my reasons. I was forced to address myself again to the emperor who gave me a letter for the chief judge and one for the archbishop of Paris. After that, I was married a month after my return from my travels. The emperor had the kindness to sign my marriage contract and to pay the expenses of my wedding. During the first journey to Italy for the emperor's coronation, everyone traveled so rapidly that everyone dropped from fatigue and sleep. The emperor stayed several days at the Palace of Stupinigi, a league from Turin. The emperor went on several stag hunts. It was me who always loaded his carbine. The empress said to the emperor, we must stay here for some days because everyone is extremely tired. The emperor said, they are spineless. See, Rustam, he travels night and day with me. He's not tired. He always looks good. The next day, we departed for Alexandria, and we rode through the terrain of Marengo, where the great battle had been fought. A day later, the emperor passed the night in Milan in his palace, which had been prepared to receive him. And we stayed there nearly a month while making short trips in the kingdom. After that, the emperor was crowned king of Italy, and the emperor departed for Fontainebleau, passing by Monsigny and Lyon.
We arrived all alone. All the carriages and all the men on horseback had stayed behind us, and they arrived one day after us. I was still in the list of the Mameluke companies who were attached to the guard as I was married. I wanted to get my discharge, but I always delayed in order to get my regimental pay. I had not received it for three years. I wrote several times, Monsieur Murat, sergeant in the Mamluks. I never received a reply. In the fourth, which I wrote to him, I indicated to him that if he did not wish to pay me what he owed me, that I would have myself paid by the emperor. It seemed to me that he was afraid because he showed my last one to his colonel. He wrote me a very honest one, but at the bottom of the letter, the colonel had written some lines telling me, an inferior must obey his superior. I shall write to the emperor. I replied, when he writes to the emperor, he should send letter to me and I will give it to him, whom I am with both day and night. I did not receive his reply. Some days later, Monsieur Murat, sergeant, came to St. Cloud to me at nine o'clock in the morning out of uniform. He sat down by me. He began a conversation saying to me, I received a letter from you. It has seemed extremely harsh in the manner that it was written. I said to him, very possibly what has angered me is that you know full well that this is the fourth letter that I have written to you. If you had taken the trouble to make a reply to the third, you would not have found the fourth so harsh. Several days ago, I received a letter from you where Monsieur de Lettre threatened me, saying to me in a fear I must obey his superior. Do you believe then that I fear his threats? No! No! He had better get that in his head. I have nothing to do with him. The emperor's my chief. I know no other than him. From now on, if he writes me threatening letters, I shall tell the emperor. What I think of him in you, Monsieur Murat. For three years now, I have asked you for nothing. Why will you not pay me my Mamluk pay? He said to me, because I have been promoted to officer, and I have spent your money to buy horses. I said to him, it is a result of my pay, but it is not honest on your part not to have made any reply to several letters that I have written to you. My wife, who was by my side, sought to change the conversation so that we would not be talking about matters so disputive. I said to her with regret that she should not get involved in a matter that she did not know about, and she went to her room, and I said to Mira, by what right have you kept the Mamluk pay for such a long time? You are in my house now. You shall not leave my house without paying me what you owe me. Otherwise, I shall have you arrested by the guard. And I shall speak to Marshal Pissier, who was in the Emperor's service. He said, very well then. I have 300 francs. That will pay you for today. The rest, I shall pay you when I have the money. I said to him, I do not want that. I shall take the 300 francs on account. And you are going to give me on that account an order in your own hand to the quartermaster of the Chesters of the guard payable 100 francs per month to Monsieur or to Madame Rustam until the debt of payment is finished. And I was given it all. And I asked Marshal Bessier for my discharge, which he gave me. And I had it signed by the marshals and the general of the guard and the colonels. My wife was delighted that I had asked for my discharge because I had nothing more to do with the Mamluk Corps. Uh, the same year, the day of Algiers sent several horses to the emperor with a pair of pistols and a wild fowling gun all festooned with carved coral, which were in the emperor's bedroom. I wanted to put it with the others in his office, but Monsieur Jean-Baptiste Hébert, his head valet de chambre, said to me, You may not go into his bedroom without informing the emperor. The same day, as I took the emperor into his office, he passed through his bedroom. I said to him, Sire, if your majesty wishes... I will put the weapons which are here in your majesty's office with the others. He said to me, let us see, show them to me. He examined the rifle carefully and he said to me, take it, I'm giving it to you. And the pistols too, because they are all alike. Carry them to your room. My wife was seven months pregnant when I departed for the campaign in Prussia and in Poland, which lasted for 11 months. The first great battle was fought at Yana, and the entire Prussian army in the time of a few days was destroyed. But before the battle, during the night, the emperor wanted to visit the outposts himself, accompanied by two marshals, Prince Bergesi, Marshal de Rock, and myself, who never left him. The emperor visited the left bank of the army, and he wanted to pass in front of the sentries in order to visit the right. At the moment when we had arrived, right at the end, there was a volley of shots towards the emperor. 
They believed that we were the enemy. We all of us surrounded the emperor from all sides so that the balls would not touch him. And we cried out, Halt your fire! We are French! And so the shooting ceased, and we returned into the ranks without having suffered any danger. The emperor slept that night on a board. I had given him a handkerchief to put over his head and his coat, which I always had with me. I arranged a bed of straw in his hut, and I covered him with his coat. And the battle commenced. At seven o'clock in the morning, there was a very thick fog. One could not see very clearly, but towards ten o'clock, we had clement weather. On the day of the battle, the emperor slept in Yenna itself, the father week day. He had all the prisoners sent home telling them, I do not wage war on the Saxons. And the Prussians were sent on into the interior of France. Some days later, the emperor made his entry to Berlin at the head of all his guard and stayed at the king's palace. Later, we departed for Warsaw, passing through Posen. After having stayed some time in Warsaw, we departed for Pultusk, where a battle again was fought against the Russians, which we won, many prisoners and cannon. The weather was foul. All the soldiers complained of the cold, but it was not as cold as in Russia. That was where I received a letter from my mother-in-law. She announced to me that my wife had been delivered of a boy. I went for joy. I was as happy as a king to have a boy. The same day, I informed the emperor that my wife had had a boy. He said to me, that is good. I have one Mamluke more. He will succeed you. I hope for it. And we departed for Eilau in Prussia for us to have another battle. And we won. And we took 25 pieces of cannon. Not many prisoners, but many dead. The wounded who were lying on the battlefield were hidden by the amount of snow. They were seen only by their heads. I always had provisions on battle days. I had with me a bottle of eau de vie. I distributed it myself to the wounded to give a little strength in the snow. I myself, on the day of the Battle of Eilau, was almost frozen, and I did not, thanks to Monsieur Von Gar, aide de camp to the Prince de Neuchâtel. It had been several days since I had slept. I was holding my horse by the bridle, and I was hidden half of my body in the snow, and I fell asleep amidst the noise of cannon fired repeatedly. Monsieur Von Gar spotted me. He came to me and said, You unfortunate creature, what are you doing here? You are going to be frozen. You must not fall asleep. The same instant the emperor mounted his horse, I found myself right behind the emperor and Mr. Tourneur, who was the emperor's chamberlain, was riding behind me. He did not dare to advance too far because the cannibals were falling around us like hail. He worried his horse intentionally and he fell on the snow as if he was on a mattress. And he said to me, I beg you, Monsieur Rustam, but I am unable to ride. I am going to return to headquarters. I would ask you to tell the emperor that I have suffered a fall from my horse and I cannot follow. Everyone who was there laughed heartily. The emperor did not speak to me about it and I said nothing either. And we departed some days after the battle for Osterode to take up our army billets. We stayed at Osterode for several days. The emperor one evening was playing cards at the Prince de Neuchâtel, Marshal de Rock, several other people. He went a little money. He had the kindness. He had the kindness to ask for me and handed me 500 francs of his winnings, saying to me, take it, this is for you. After that, the emperor set up his headquarters at Wittgenstein, where we stayed until spring. During that interval, I made several journeys with the emperor to Danzig, Marienwerder, and Marienburg. There was much talk of peace. I was highly content with that, so that I could have the good fortune of seeing my wife and my son. It was nearly six months since I had seen her, but I received news of them almost every day through the emperor's couriers extremely regularly. This consoled me a little because it was too much to be deprived of my family for six months. One day there arrived an aide-de-camp from Marshal Ney to warn the Emperor that the Russians had attacked Marshal Ney's corps with 40,000 men and the Marshal had beaten a retreat over 15 leagues without losing a piece of cannon nor any soldiers. In two days' time, the Emperor regrouped his army and himself set off to act as commander-in-chief, as always. The Emperor departed for Marshal Ney's headquarters. He arrived there at 11 o'clock in the evening. He received the marshal. He said to him, laughing, What is this, Mr. Marshal Ney? 
You've let yourself be beaten by the Russians? Marshal said to him, Sire, I swear to you, on my word of honor, it was not my fault. They attacked me. When I was not expecting, it was great force, too. And I, at that moment, had extremely few people. I saw that the tears were rolling from the marshal's eyes. He was not happy at having beaten a retreat. The emperor was saying to Marshal Ney, when supping with him, Really, that is nothing. We shall fix that mistake. The following day, we began to attack the enemy on all sides and went in pursuit up to Friedland, passing through Adlau, where we fought a great battle during the winter. It was Prince Murat who commanded all the cavalry in the army. He even had the title of Lieutenant of the Emperor. On arriving in Friedland, we found the entire Russian army standing for battle before a very strong river. The following day, the emperor attacked with Tyrellers, and the main strength of the army was hidden in the woods. While waiting in order to gauge the enemy's strength, and after having heavily engaged on all sides, there were skirmishes from 7 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. After the emperor saw the enemy holding fast, he engaged them on all sides as he intended. Marshal Ney had come at the same moment he ordered him to take that division into quick march over the bridge, which was behind the city and the other two divisions would support from the right. The marshal said to the emperor, Yes, sire, I'm going to execute your majesty's orders, and he will be satisfied. I hope for it. He took his division and marched straight over the bridge, crossing through the town. He arrived at his target and set the bridge on fire. So here was the enemy cut in two. Those on the right were nearly destroyed by Marshal Ney. When he was on the bridge with the division... The two other divisions were on the right. He had quick marched opposite the river. The enemy wanted to pass over the bridge, but it was already cut off. He wanted then to swim across. More than three quarters were drowned, leaving for the greater part their cannon and baggage. Victory was completely ours. At the same moment, the emperor called Marshal Ney, hugged him, telling him, That is good, Monsieur Marshal. I am greatly happy. You have won the battle. The marshal said, Sire, we are French. We shall always win. That evening, the emperor set up his headquarters in the town of Friedland. The following day, the emperor visited the battlefield and departed. The same day to join Prince Murat, who was at the outposts two leagues from Tilsit. The emperor slept at the outpost on a farm. The next day, Prince Murat told the emperor that the enemies were standing ready for battle ahead of us with five and 6,000 Kalmuks and Bashkirs with their arrows. The emperor said, that is nothing. He passed orders to a division of cuirassiers to put on their cloaks in order to hide their cuirasses. Arrows will not bite into a cuirass. And he had the march without delay to the enemy commanded by Prince Murat. He charged and scattered them on all sides and pursued them as far as Tilsit, where we found the bridge burnt by the enemy. We looked for ways to rebuild it. A Russian prince had just arrived before Emperor Napoleon to ask for peace. The emperor received him well, but he did not want to make arrangements with him, saying to him, I wish to make arrangements with the emperor of Russia, not with others. That prince departed the same day to go to the emperor of Russia, and we spent the night in the Faubourg of Tilsit. The following day, a house was prepared in the town for the emperor. The two French and Russian armies were separated by the Neiman. All was greatly calm. The emperor had a great raft set on the Neiman, embellished with garlands of flowers to receive the emperor of Russia. They made their way, each from their side to the raft, at the moment that the emperors embarked in their small boats to go to meet each other. Many cannons were fired with shouts repeated several times, Long live Emperor Napoleon! The following day at noon, the emperor of Russia had arrived in the town. A house had been prepared for him. Emperor Napoleon had sent fine or fine Arabian horse to the shore of the Neiman for the emperor to ride. And we all rode out to meet him. All the guard on horse and on foot stood in arms along a great street where the two emperors were lodged. The emperor of Russia rode on the shore of the Neiman with the emperor of the French. And the emperor of Russia thought all the guard magnificent. The emperor of the French showed them to the emperor of Russia. Here are my horse grenadiers. Here are my chasseurs. Here are my dragoons. Indeed, everything. 
When we arrived in front of the house, which was intended for the Emperor of Russia, the Emperor of the French said to him, Here is your majesty's house. The Emperor of Russia said to him, Sire, permit me to ride on the end of the street in order to see all the guard who I find superb. And they went to the end of the high street and returned to the house which had been prepared for the Emperor of the French and died together. Two days later, the King and Queen of Prussia also came to Tilsit. They were lodged in the miller's house, and both of them came every day to the Emperor of the French and the Emperor of Russia to dine with the Emperor Napoleon. One day at dinner, Emperor Napoleon was saying to the King of Prussia, Is it not true, Monsieur King of Prussia? Your Majesty does not like war, because Your Majesty is not happy with the campaign that he has just waged. King of Prussia replied to him, Yes, sire, Your Majesty knows it better than I. His head still lowered. The Queen of Prussia came very often to pay visits to Emperor Napoleon. One day she was coiffured à la Grec. The Emperor said to her, Your Majesty is coiffured à la Turk. She said, I beg your pardon, sire. I am coiffured à la Rustam. While looking at me. Me being by the Emperor. When the Emperor was in Tilsit, the Queen of Prussia paid a visit. He received her in a small salon. Her visit lasted an hour. On leaving the emperor, she had wept a great deal because her face was all wet and her eyes large. Immediately afterwards, it was announced that the emperor's dinner was served. So the emperor came out of his office. He found the prince de Neuchâtel in the dining room. He said, well, Britier, the beautiful queen of Russia weeps. Prettily. She believes that I have come just for her beautiful eyes. The following day, Emperor Alexander, the King and Queen of Prussia, the Grand Duke Constantine came to dine with Emperor Napoleon, and I was besides the Emperor in order to serve him. The Queen of Prussia and the Emperor Alexander were looking at me a great deal. Napoleon said to Alexander, Sire, Rustam was one of your subjects. He replied to him, How is that, Sire? Yes, because he's from Georgia. As Georgia belongs to your majesty, then he is one of your subjects. After that, Alexander looked at me smiling. All the time that we stayed in Tilsit, we were constantly celebrating Emperor Napoleon and that of Russia, went every day to review the French Army Corps and all the guard, which was extremely numerous. They mounted to close to 140,000 men, all of them veteran soldiers. The two emperors went arm in arm and promenaded every evening through the streets all alone. Some days later, the emperor's guard gave a great open-air dinner for the guard of the Russian emperor. All the necessary provisions, especially including a great deal of wine, were brought from Warsaw, from Danzig and Elving. Tables were set up on all the town's promenades. At dinner, the first toast was raised to the Emperor of Russia. As the meal was served, at least 600 cannon shots were fired. After dinner, all the French and Russian troops were in high spirits. Three quarters of them were drunk. The French in Russian coats, the Russians in a coat or French cap. All the time after the meal, they danced around the city, and they all came pell-mell, passing by the window of the Emperor of the French. They cried out, Long live the Emperors! Russian grenadier had shrunk a little too much. He could not walk straight. He fell while walking. A French grenadier picked him up by the arm, saying to him, B, that the dot, C, that the dot, you are trying to march like us, while giving him a kick up the derriere. Everyone laughed happily to hear the conversation of those two grenadiers. Some days later, the emperor was dressing in the morning. His legion cross was not attached well in his coat. I wanted to attach it. He said to me, leave it. I'm doing it intentionally. After that, we rode to pay a visit to the Emperor of Russia. On leaving the Emperor of Russia's house, he saw at the gate a company of grenadiers standing at attention. The Emperor of the French said to the Emperor of Russia, Sire, may I request the approval of your majesty to present my cross to one of your first grenadiers? He said to him, Yes, sire, he will be all too happy. The longest-serving soldier was brought forward. The emperor took off his cross, which was not well attached, and gave it to the grenadier, who was extremely happy. He kissed the emperor's hand and the corner of his coat, and everyone repeated, Long live great Napoleon! And we returned to the house. The following day, we departed for Dresden, passing through Posen and Glogau, and we arrived in Dresden. The king of Saxony came to the emperor to receive him. The emperor stayed in Dresden for five days, always in the midst of festivities. During this interview, interval, the household staff prepared for the 
departure of the emperor for Paris. Each person had his designated place for the departure. I saw no place for myself because I had gone on all the campaigns on horseback with the emperor. I asked the great equerry with which people I would travel. He said to me, the emperor wants you to go with him. And I will go in front of his carriage. A small cabriolet had been made intentionally for me. If the emperor gives you permission, I have a place for you in a Berlin. The same day, I addressed the emperor, asking him how I would travel. He said to me, with me in the cabriolet for my carriage. I said to him, sire, I'm too tired. I've done all the campaigns on horseback from here to Paris. It's too far. I would never be able to resist my fatigue. He said to me, how do you want to go? Your place is at my side and never to leave me. Very well. When you are extremely tired, you shall take a post coach, which may be found in each post house. We departed on the following day for Paris. I longed so much to arrive in order to see my wife, whom I had been deprived of seeing for 11 months, and my son for seven months. It took us five days to come from Dresden to St. Cloud, night and day. The fifth day at 7 o'clock in the morning, we were passing through the Bois de Bologna. The emperor said to me, look now, Rustam, there is your wife. What? You do not see her? I saw well that the emperor was saying this to make a joke. I looked on all sides. I did not see anyone. I said to him, I beg your pardon, sire. My wife is still in her bed with her fat son. At the bridgehead at the St. Cloud Bridge, a triumphal arch had been built for the arrival of the emperor, but arrived all alone. He passed so rapidly that no one had the time to remove the barrier. The emperor rode around it, and so we arrived at the palace of St. Cloud. Everyone was still asleep. The emperor rushed from his carriage and went up the stairs four at a time and went into the empress's rooms. As for me, I did not have any other good fortune than to go up without delay to my own rooms where I found my wife from whom I received the sincerest caresses and tenderness and who I had been deprived of for 11 months. The following day, I wanted to go see my son with his wet nurse in Medneil near Saint Germain en Laye. My wife said to me, No, my friend, you are too tired from your journey. You will go see him tomorrow because she wanted to give me a surprise. Two days before my arrival, my wife had taken my son with his wet nurse to the house of one of my friends named Le Peltier, who resi resided at Port Jaun near St. Clou. The day following my arrival, my wife said to me, Madame Peltier is ill. We're going to pay her a visit. When we arrived at her house, she was in as good health as we were. And we went to sit down in the shade of some chestnut trees. And the wet nurse and my son came up beside me. I looked at this little one, so good he was. I said to my wife, oh, my Lord, here's a fine child. How handsome he is. I looked carefully at his face. I said to my wife, I wager that he is my son. He has exactly my face in my eyes and so it was that everyone began to laugh and I took the child I pressed him to my heart it was at that moment that I saw my wife had prepared an agreeable surprise chapter four Mr. Corvisar attended every two or three days when his majesty dressed one day Mr. Corvisar was announced he said that he could enter so there you are great charlatan have you killed many people today not many sire his Majesty. Corvisar, I will not live long. I feel weaker than five or six years ago. He was laughing as he said this. Corvisar said, Sire, I am not here to prevent you from that. His Majesty tugged his ears laughing. You believe that, Corvisar? I will bury you. Corvisar replied, I believe it tru truly, Sire, myself and many others. His Majesty said, smiling, be quiet, charlatan. What is it that you are holding in your hand? It is my cane, sire. His majesty, it is utterly ugly. Isn't that pretty? How could a man like you carry an ugly stick like that? Corvisar said, sire, this cane here, it would have cost me dearly, and I got it very cheaply. His majesty, let us see, Corvisar, how much did it cost you? Fifteen hundred francs, sire. That is not dear. His Majesty said, oh my lord, 1,500 francs. Show it to me, that ugly stick. His Majesty inspected the cane, every detail. He noticed the portrait on a golden medal of Jean-Jacques Rousseau on top of the cane. Tell me, Corsair, is this Jean-Jacques' cane? 
Where did you find it? Doubtless, it is one, <laughs> one of your clients who has made you this present. My faith, that is a pretty souvenir that you have. Corvus Star said, I beg your pardon, sir, it cost me 1,500 francs. His Majesty. In fact, Corvus Star, it is not worth the price because he was a great man. In other words, he was a great charlatan like Corvus Star. Corvus Star was laughing while listening. His Majesty said, in fact, Corvus Star, he was a great man of his kind. He did some wonderful things. After this, he tugged Mr. Corvus Star's ear, saying to him, Corvus Star, you want to ape Jen Jack? After that, his majesty said, Corvisar, are there many sick people in Paris? He replied, but sire, not too many. His majesty said, let us see, Corvisar, how much money did you make yesterday in the morning? But sire, I did not count it. You have earned at least 200 francs? Not that much, sire. But Corvisar, surely you received at least 20 francs per visit. He answered, I beg your pardon, sire. I do not have a fixed fee. I received up to three francs. His Majesty said, well done, you are humane. At that moment, His Majesty was dressing for a hunting shoot in the St. Germain Forest. His Majesty said, Corvisar, will I have good weather for my hunt? Corvisar said, yes, sire, the weather is superb. Do you hunt, Corvisar? Yes, I hunt from time to time. His Majesty, so you leave your sick people to die. His Majesty, where do you hunt, Corvisar? Sire, I hunt at Chateau. The Duke de Montebello's place, His Majesty. Corvisar, I want you to come hunting with me. I want to know if you shoot well. Sire, that is great honor for me. I do not have my rifles, His Majesty. You will be given my rifles. Do you hear a stem? Corvisar, sire, I would not be able to use Your Majesty's rifles. Why not, Charlton? Because I am left-handed, His Majesty. That does not matter. I want you to come. It would be too late to send for your rifles. Corvisar climbed into the Grand Equerry's carriage and departed for Saint Germain. This was the only time Mr. Corvisar hunted with His Majesty. Mr. Corvisar was often present with the Emperor dressed. One day, as they conversed, Mr. Burien was mentioned. The Emperor was saying, I wager, Corvisar, that I could have Burien locked up alone in the Tuileries garden, and he would find money. He's a very sharp man. In the apartments of the Tuileries, which were occupied by the emperor, his bedroom gave onto the garden. One day, the emperor was getting dressed. The little Napoleon was announced. He said that he would enter. He took him in his arms, kissed him a great deal. He was between the two windows. He showed him in the garden. The emperor asked, whose is that garden? He replied to him, my uncle's. After that, he tugged his ear, saying to him, after me, it will be for you. I hope that you will have a good inheritance. During the Dresden campaign, the emperor was chatting one day with Monsieur Marais on account of the affairs of the king of Bavaria. He said to Monsieur Le Duc de Bassano, when we are in Munich, I shall not leave two stones standing. General Gio, who commanded a cavalry division of the guard with a battery of light artillery one day before battle in Montero, was surprised by the enemy and had lost several cannon. Some hours later, the emperor learned that General Gio's division had just lost its cannon. So the emperor had the general come before him who was near the main road that led to Montero. The emperor was in the middle of his general staff. When he saw the general, he was furious with him, saying to him, Monsieur le General, I entrusted my cannon to you, and what have you done with them? Let your wife be violated? I do not give a damn, but let my cannon not be captured! Throwing his hat onto the ground in the middle of everyone. The general tried to tell him that it was not his fault. The emperor said to him in a very harsh tone, Shut up, sir, you are a coward! The emperor had hands, feet, very small, very well formed. I am certain that the prettiest woman in Paris did not have once, like those of the emperor. All his body was made to be painted. He took a bath nearly every day. He often changed his shirts to a day. He wore every day the uniform of a chasseur of the guards, sometimes the uniform of a grenadier, but for ceremonies or when he was reviewing his troops. The clothing that he put on every day, be it in Paris or while traveling, were a pair of socks, silk boots, long drawers, flannel vest, Dutch linen shirt, white 
cashmere culotte, similar vest, light muslin cravat, and a black silk collar, his shister uniform, or gritted tears, as I have said. When traveling, he rarely wore shoes. He always put on boots. When he was living in his palaces, he was very often in shoes and gold buckles. He only wore boots for the hunt. Lavinia was the longest serving of the Empress Picurus, father of nine children. He had been put on a pension of 600. This was not enough to get bread for 10 people. As I knew Lavinia, I had even held one of his children at the baptism font. I asked him to write a petition for his majesty in order to be given some assistance from his majesty. I did this from my heart. And I did not think that this would have caused any disagreement to Mr. Calancourt, Grand Equerry. I had the petition on our journey to Compiègne. One morning, as His Majesty dressed, I handed the petition to the Emperor, and I pleaded with His Majesty to do something for the poor Lavinia. The Emperor read the petition. He said to me, Rustam, go and find Calancourt, who was in the salon with the high-ranking officers who were waiting for the Emperor's morning appearance. So I announced Mr. Calancourt to the Emperor. He told me that he should enter. At that moment, His Majesty was in a bad humor. He said, Calancourt, how are you managing my stables? How's that? A man who has served me in the campaigns in Italy and Egypt, the longest serving of my household, and you have had the grace to give him a pension of 600 francs, and you are going to give, without doubt, his position to one of your domestics? Monsieur Calancourt tried to make some comment on this, but the emperor turned his back on him and he said to me, Ah, oh, well, a troubled gentleman. Rustam, do you know how to write? I replied to him, a little, sire. Well, good. Write to Lavinia today. Tell him that I am granting him a pension of 1,200 livres from my treasury, and I'm giving him the position of caretaker of the Versailles stables at the wage of 24 francs, 2,400 francs. Since that time, I have only received one visit from Lavinia. I knew very well formerly Monsieur Bouzouard, head of division at the Bank of France. One day I was at dinner at his house with all my family. At dinner with us there was a man named Morzo, a former surgeon of the Swiss Guard. He was without pension, without fortune. He was very deaf and aged 78 years old. Monsieur Bizouard was saying, Father Morisot, the emperor will do something for Monsieur Rustam. Unburdened, this poor man was so happy that he shed tears of joy. So I had a petition made by Monsieur Bouzouar without saying anything to Monsieur Morzo about what we wanted to do for him. And to relieve his old age for several days, I kept the request in my pocket without being able to hand it to the emperor because I wanted to wait for a day of good humor because sometimes no one would dare to speak to him. One day, as the emperor came out of his bath, Mr. Corbusart was announced. He said that he should answer on seeing the doctor. He said, laughing, So, here you are, Shelatin! What are they saying in Paris? He was singing while dressing. I profited from this favorable moment to ask him for 300 livres of pension for my protege. The emperor said to me, What? 300 francs? But give it in one go without doubt? No, sire, per year. Besides, this is not a great sacrifice. The man is 78 years old. Mr. Corvisar, who was present, joined me, and the emperor asked him, Do you know him? He did not wait for his answer and said to him, laughing, Ah, besides, all the charlatans know each other. He would use that expression with Corvisar to tease him. His Majesty was at the headquarters in Schoenbrunn. Monsieur Lanfranc, a grand doctor from Vienna, would come to see His Majesty. He would stay sometimes an entire day with His Majesty when he was in his bath. And he dressed. His Majesty admired him highly for his reputation and his merit. His Majesty had Monsieur Corvisar come to Schoenbrunn. However, His Majesty was not ill. In winter, as in summer, his majesty always coughed a little. Mr. Corvisar, on his arrival in Schoenbrunn, attended the emperor's morning dressing and bedtime. He stayed three days, after which he asked the emperor to go back to France. What? You want to depart already? Are you bored? No, sire, but I would rather be in Paris and Schoenbrunn. Stay with me. I'm going to fight a great battle, and you shall see what a battle is. No, sire. I thank you. I'm not curious. Ah, you are a gawker. You wish to go to Paris in order to kill your patients one by one. 
and Sir Corvisar departed the following day. The Emperor had entrusted to my supervision all his weapons of war, and I had a man under my orders to clean them and put them in order. He came on all the journeys. For this single duty, a pair of pistols were always put in the Emperor's saddle holsters in the case that His Majesty wanted to fire while riding at birds, and it often happened that the pistols were put out of order by the horses jolting, which caused me more than one moment of disagreement with the Emperor because he held me responsible for this inconvenience. Monsieur Lepage, His Majesty's Arcbusier thought of adding a small bolt that had been pushed before being used. I hastened to acquaint the emperor with it and to explain to him this ingenious mechanism. He agreed with me that this method appeared excellent. We were in this period in Berlin. One morning after his breakfast, his majesty mounted his horse with his general staff to go in a promenade. We arrived at a wide plain. The emperor noticed that it was covered with crows. Immediately, he launched into a great gallop, took a pistol and fired at them. But having neglected to push on the bolt, the shot did not fire. Anger took hold of him. He threw it to the ground and rode towards me with his riding crop raised. I was in the middle of his general's staff. When seeing him approaching, I abandoned my position. I galloped so that he could not reach me. As he was not going to give up, I stopped in front of him. He heaped me with rebuke and said that I had not taken care of his pistols. I tried to explain myself, but he turned his back on me and went to join his general staff and said to them, That rascal Ruth Stam is the reason I have not killed a crow. Whereas for my part, I went to pick up the pistol which I fired into the air to show that I was not at fault. Grand Eckery came to me, inspected it, and saw that it was in good condition. General Rapp joined me and brought me words of consolation. I was gloomy. He said to me, do not fret, my dear Stam. You know the emperor is quick-tempered, but he knows how to appreciate you. The following day, his majesty said to me, very well, you great rascal. Will you pay attention to my pistols? As usual, sire, I have neglected nothing that concerns my duties. He commanded me to be silent, and yet in the future he made use of the small bolt by means of which a pistol did not fail. The Grand Eckery, who appeared convinced that I was not at fault, wanted to follow up this incident, however, and said to me that he would impose a fine on the person who was charged with the care of the weapons. I still have difficulty in imagining what the motive was that made him act that way. Was it a way to keep him on tender hooks? There was no necessity for that, since he fulfilled his duty perfectly. Therefore, I said that, Mr. LeDuc, if you maintain that he should pay a fine, it is me who will pay it. He reprimanded this unfortunate man who came to me in order to clarify this incident, of which he did not understand anything. I reassured him, telling him that he should not be worried that if there were any mistakes, they would be on my part since I had inspected the weapons before giving them to the emperor. I went back to the Duc de Vicence in order to tell him that this action would be the greatest injustice. And the affair stopped there. The emperor made the journey to Venice. He took very few people. The viceroy's house, which was in Milan, being, as it were, his Marshal Duroc was in the carriage, which was hitched to eight horses. We arrived at the foot of Monsigny. The weather was terrible. The emperor wanted to go up in his carriage, but a quarter of an hour before he arrived at the plateau, there came a dreadful hurricane and wind with whirlwinds of snow that blinded the horses. They refused to go on, and we had to call a halt, impatient at being inactive like this. The emperor got out of the carriage with the marshal, and the carriages held the rest of the men back. We walked on, all three of us, with the intention of reaching a small hut, which was on the road a small distance. But the storm grew stronger, and the emperor was suffocating. He was losing his breath. The marshal, although quite strong at difficulty in fighting against the wind, I took the emperor up in my arms, and I carried him, as it were, not as one would carry a child, because his feet were touching the ground. But I used my strength to carry him forward. We arrived, not without difficulty, at the small hut. It was inhabited by a peasant who sold oats de vie to passers-by. The emperor went in and sat down near the chimney where there was a modest fire. His majesty said, well, to rock, you must admit that this poor Rustem is extremely strong, extremely courageous. He turned to me and said, what are we going to do, my great lad? 
We shall go on, sire, I replied. The monastery is not much further, and I busied myself immediately with searching in the house for what could suit to build a makeshift sedan chair. I found in a corner a twisted ladder, which I appropriated. I picked up some pieces of firewood. I made them into hopes, which I tied tightly together, and to the ladder with th thick rope. I put his cloak on top. I was constructing my little carriage under his eyes. This made him laugh like someone blessed. He said to me, my great lad, we are going to travel. I pointed out to him that the regent had remained in the carriage, and I proposed to him that I would fetch it. You are right, he said to me. I departed during that short walk. I saw with pleasure that the weather was beginning to calm. I went down to the carriage. I took the regent and carried it back to the emperor in its box, which I put on the ladder. And he sat down on top. I took two peasants who were at the hunt, and I positioned them one at each end of the ladder, and me in the middle, who would hold up the cloak so that it would not track down the hoops. We arrived at last, where the good monks were, who received the ebb with all the marks of the greatest attachment and recognition. He treated them with the greatest respect. We spent the night at the monastery, and the carriages arrived the following day. At 10 o'clock in the morning, I intend, attended the emperor's dressing, and after his breakfast, he asked me if I knew two peasants who had carried him. I said they had stayed too at the convent. I said to him, sire, they are below, and I had them come up. The emperor was in his bedroom with the grand marshal. His majesty asked them their names. You are good fellows, he said to them. To all give them each 600 and 300 francs in payment. We then set off for Milan. The emperor recounted to the whole court the manner in which I enabled him to cross the Monsigny, and he wished greatly to praise my attachment to himself. Indeed, he appeared to be infinitely grateful to me for something which was only natural, and that anyone in my place and a doubt of my strength would have done. And there were no compliments that I did not receive from the grand personages who were around him. Monsieur F., then his comptroller said to me, The emperor appears so pleased with you that I have no doubt that you shall have the cross. If I am given it, I shall receive it with pleasure, I said to him, but never would I ask for it. Besides, I considered myself recompensed beyond the difficulty that I had endured for, the pleasure that I felt, and I would not have wanted to give up that journey for any amount of money. We departed for Venice, where we stayed several days. We returned to Milan. While on our way, a courier caught up with the emperor and approached his carriage to hand him dispatches from Paris. A moment later, he lowered the window of his carriage and handed me a letter from my wife. It was opened! Take it, Rustam. It's a letter from your wife. I smiled too, taking it. He said to me, she is asking for Venetian chain necklaces from Venice. When we arrived in Milan, getting down from the carriage, the emperor said to me, If you do not bring Venetian chain necklaces, you shall be badly received. Sire, replied I to him, I shall buy some here. The viceroy said to me, Rustam, it is me who wants to give them to you. In fact, the following day, his highness sent for me and handed me a package of Venetian chain necklaces for my wife. I received all the letters from my wife by courier, Monsieur de la Valette, had had the kindness to accord me that favor, and the emperor never appeared to disapprove of it. This idea of opening, on occasion my letters, at least when the dispatches reached him on the road, has served me well in a particular circumstance. A colonel of my acquaintance, who had been wrongly disgraced, had been begging me to hand several petitions to the emperor, being in Paris. His majesty had always promised me, but casually. I presume that he was waiting for details from the war ministry when in Spain he wrote to me, in a letter from my wife and spoke to me of his predicament. He said to me that the outcome appeared to be taking so long that he was begging for me to speak about it to the emperor and to choose a moment of good humor so that he would not reject it. In other words, those moments when the emperor was singing, his majesty received his courier at night. Being in a castle near Madrid, he said to me, Rustam, have men of all come down. When he arrived, I retired to the salon where I was to spend the night. And as he came out of the emperor's room, Mr. Meneval handed me a letter from my wife, all open. He said to me the following day as he dressed, Rustam, who is the colonel question? 
I reminded him then that it was the same one whom I had spoken of to him several times in Paris, and I pleaded with him once more to have him give it justice, that I would answer for him, and that would that would be a brave step forward. He gave his good intention and promised me to deal with it on arriving in Paris. In fact, I had only the trouble of reminding his memory once. And a few days later, I learned from General Drouot, who was charged with these sorts of matters, and to whom I had chatted about it, that the council was to deliver a judgment that same day on this. Emperor said to me that evening, you must be happy. See, your friend has been reinstated. I knew this through General Drouot, who was kind enough to tell me on leaving the council. It was on this journey where the emperor went one day into Barouche to go to join Marshal Ney's army corps. With his army in his carriage was the Prince of Neuchâtel. I presented myself as usual to get up in front of the carriage when the emperor said to me, Rustam, give your place to Murat and you ride on horseback. We traveled the whole day and arrived in the evening greatly late. One morning at Malmaison, the emperor was getting dressed. His window gave onto a little canal in front of the chateau. There were swans on it. His majesty asked me for his carbine. I brought it to him. He fired the swans. The empress was in her boudoir, putting on her clothes. She heard the shot keep running in her chemise, wrapped in a large shawl. She leapt after the emperor, saying to him, Pull it apart. Do not shoot my swans, I beg you. He persisted, saying to her, Josephine, leave me alone. This amuses me. So she took me by the arm and said to me, Rostab, do not give him the carbine. The emperor said to me, give me it. The emperor saw me in this predicament and removed the carbine from my hands and she carried it away. The emperor laughed like a madman. At that same time, the emperor went hunting in Butar. Afterwards, he took a promenade in the woods of St. Kukufa. Where there is a very deep lake, his majesty wanted to promenade on the water and said to me, Go and get the rowing boat. It was the town of Avra that had presented it to him. I got into a little boat. The boatman took me to the rowing boat. And before he was close enough to it, I jumped. The little boat keeled over. And there I was in the water. I went to the bottom and felt the mud. I gave a kick, which made me come back to the surface. The emperor shouted to me, Rustam, do you know how to swim? No, I said to him. He said immediately to the chasseurs who were accompanying him, those who know how to swim, go quick to help her step. But by dint of struggling, I took hold of the big boat and entered it. I was back on board. I saw several chasseurs who had put down their uniforms all ready to pull me out. The emperor said to me, how do you not know how to swim? I want you to learn. Go to the chateau to change your clothes. Thus, I learned to swim. And on my first try, I lost a very beautiful piece of diamond jewelry that the empress had given me. At the court. There was not the habit of gambling. The emperor himself never played for money. However, after the Battle of Eilau, when he was at Osteroda, he played Vetillon with Nirav Bertier Duroc Bessier. I was in the salon next door. I heard people calling, Rustam! Repeated several times. I went in, the emperor took a handful of gold and said to me, Take it, here are my winnings. There were 600 francs. The following day, he gave me as much, and on the day following several hundred francs, he appeared delighted to have won. Those were the only times that I saw him gamble. And one other time at Rambouillet, where he gave me 400 francs, it was the empress who had the kindness to call me herself into the emperor's room. We were fonts and blow. People were speaking of the emperor's departure for the eel of Elba. His majesty was greatly sad and could barely speak. One day I was asked along with several others, and with the forms of charge d'affaires, if I was of the intention to follow the emperor. I did not believe that I had to answer the person anything, except that I would speak about it with the emperor. I had one condition to make. They added that on the Isle of Elba, his majesty would have no need of me as Mameluke, that then I would do service in the antechamber. I replied that I would do my service as in the past, and that likewise I would recognize no master but the emperor, and that I would take orders only from the grand marshal. And so the discussion became acrimonious when the grand personage from the court became involved, telling me that I was his man and that I could not do otherwise. I answered him that I belonged to no one but myself. My attachment to his majesty 
was all in my engagement with his majesty, that besides that was all my business, and that I was not accountable to anyone for my intentions in these circumstances. Never had I been more offended and more humiliated. When my lord Count Bertrand called me and asked me, with the kindness and gentleness that characterized him, if I would follow the emperor in any other circumstances where I had my mind freer and more alert, I would have opened my heart to him. But the new situation which I had just had with the others had deprived me of all my faculties, and I settled for replying that without doubt I had the desire for it, but that I would talk about it with the emperor. I had written the evening before to my wife, and I told her that I would depart perhaps through the Isle of Elba without seeing her, and that in this case she would receive on my arrival in that land some time later the necessary instructions for putting our affair in order and coming to meet me with her children, but that, however, I would make it my duty to go to her and make my farewells. I took the chance then of asking permission from the emperor who gave it to me, and I departed one morning, but his sadness deprived me of the courage necessary to talk to him about myself and he knew nothing of the disagreements that I had just undergone. I arrived to Paris. My wife said to me that she had just written to me to let me know that she proved greatly by following the emperor and that she was completely ready, despite it costing her so much to leave her mother and father, to join me as soon as I would ask her to. This was also the content of her letter, but she advised me when I was back in Fontainebleau to speak frankly to the emperor. She felt that my character would not any more support being ordered by those who were of a mind to do so and that I would not consent to allow myself to be humiliated by them and so I said to her that I did not have the courage to discuss with the emperor what concerned me and I wanted to risk the journey to the Isle of Elba and that if I found myself unhappy there I would arrange with the merchant of that country to take me to Italy and that from there I would return to France she was opposed to my plan telling me that they would not let me return afterwards I always had such pure intentions that I could not understand how I could be refused to live in the place where I was. And so I spent two days with my family. There I made my small financial arrangements and had a procuration drawn up by Maitre Fouché, my notary. It stated that I authorized my wife to manage my affairs while I was on the Isle of Elba. Afterwards, I departed for Fontainebleau. I arrived in the evening to the great astonishment of everyone and even the emperor whom they had not neglected to convince that I had departed, never more to return. His majesty said to me, so you are here? And said nothing more about it. I asked for the letter from my wife. No one had sent, seen it. But not counting any more on my return, one of my comrades said to me that the letter had been opened and taken to the Grand Marshal. It was not, however, held against me. As I have already said, it was a response to what I told her about having the intention of going to the Isle of Elba. The rumor was running around in the chateau that the emperor had tried to destroy himself with coal. I was appalled and did not sleep all night. As I was struck by this idea of destruction, everything filled me with gloom, and I still examined with worry the emperor's expression when, on the morning of the day following my arrival, he asked me for his pistols. As I was responsible for his weapons, in any other circumstance, I would have thought that they were for his pleasure, but in this one, I judged it appropriate not to give them to him. I did not dare to refuse him openly, so I led some reasons, and I went to find the Prince de Neuchâtel to speak to him of my fears, and to beg him to authorize me to refuse his pistols in case he should happen again. He said to me, that is no concern of mine, and abandoned me to myself. A friend who I had at Fontainebleau, and with whom I did not speak at all of this, told me that the rumor was spreading the emperor had tried to destroy himself. I told him that I had no knowledge of this. Do you know, he said to me, my dear Rustam, that this is the most unpleasant thing that could happen to you? especially if the unfortunate event happened at night. The idea would be put into the public mind that you have been won over by foreign powers to commit that murder. So I could not bear such a horrible prospect anymore. I lost my head and resolved to flee. I wrote to the emperor. I said to him that I was forced to go away and that when he judged it appropriate, he should call me back. I trusted someone with handing him my letter, but no one handed 
it to him. The style of it was perhaps highly ridiculous, given the little facility with which I wrote French and with my disorganized head. It would require, without doubt, a great deal of indulgence. But the emperor would have interpreted it, whatever it would be. I departed Fontainebleau at one o'clock. I arrived in Paris at evening to the great astonishment of my family. I stayed there and waited. My wife said to me, we must hope that nothing will happen to the emperor. Keep yourself prepared in case his majesty asks for you. It was during this period that two envoys from Monsieur le Count d'Artois came to ask me for information about the diamonds that the emperor had sent me to fetch from Monsieur Baron de la Bouillerie. As I had nothing but the truth to say, I was not highly bothered, and I replied to those gentlemen that the emperor had indeed given the order to fetch his diamonds. And I had presented myself at Monsieur de la Boulerie's, provided with a receipt from the emperor, that then he had handed me them, and that I had taken them to the emperor in his office, that he had told me to set them down, there and that I had no knowledge whatsoever of what he had done with them. And so several days passed and I learned that the emperor had departed Fontainebleau. I sensed then that his majesty had not been made aware of my letter in any way. I learned the names of the people who had accompanied him and with whom I would not have feared any disagreement. All were to my liking. So I resolved to go and join the emperor at his embarkation. And my wife went at once to the post station, Fabric says your man, to get a post chaise. She met a gentleman of our acquaintance who was in the courtyard, and he said to her, You will not succeed in finding any horses because they have just refused to provide me with any to fetch my brother-in-law at Fontainebleau. She was not discouraged and went into the office where she begged and pleaded. They said to her, Madame, they're not, they're not even enough for the sovereign service. She came back desolate. I myself was in despair. We had to resign ourselves, and moreover, I had grounds to believe that in the event that I would have found horses, I would not have been given a passport. It was not long before I became worried. A chief of police that I knew urged me to leave Paris before the king's entrance, saying to me that it would be the wisest course, that it would be better to go away and to spend some time in the countryside than to wait in Paris with the expectation of being dismissed and being exiled. All this was new for me. I could not conceive that I could be regarded as someone dangerous, but indeed he assured me that I was viewed in Paris with some anxiety, and I gave in to these reasons only at the solicitation of my family who cherished me and to whom the idea of seeing me tormented caused great distress. I therefore left Paris before the king's entrance, and I went to take refuge in Giroux. Well, I spent four months. Two months later, my family petitioned the minister of police to grant me permission to return, or at least that my return to Paris would have his agreement, and two months later, he gave his consent. Some days before the empress was due to give birth, the emperor rang for me several times at night and sent me to get news of her majesty. I went to the women who were attending the empress, and I reported to the emperor the news that they gave me. But the night that preceded the day of her delivery, the empress spent the night with her, walking her around her room by the arm. She was suffering light pains. Around six o'clock in the morning, they had calmed down. She fell asleep. The emperor went back up to his room and said to me, Rustam... Is my bath ready? Yes, sire, replied to him. He got into it immediately and had his breakfast served to him. When a half hour later, Monsieur Dubois was announced. So there you are, Dubois, the emperor said to him. What news is there? Will it be for today? Yes, sire, I will not be long, but I would ask that your majesty not come down. But why is that, Dubois? Because your majesty's presence will hinder me. But not at all. You must deliver the empress as if you were delivering a peasant woman and not worry yourself about me. But, sire, I warn your majesty that the infant is positioned badly. So the emperor asked him for explanations about that. Well, what are you going to do? But, sire, I will be obliged to use instruments. Oh, my God, said the emperor fearfully. Would it be dangerous? Sire, have to treat one or the other gently very well dubois treat the mother gently first and go down right now i'm following you monsieur dubois 
went down by the small concealed staircase which gave directly into the Empress's room. The Emperor got out of his bath suddenly and the two of us passed his clothes to him. He ran straight away to the apartment of the Empress and I followed him there eagerly also to see what was happening there. He went into the room of Her Majesty. All the grand officers of the crown had already arrived and spread out up to within the great salon whose Doors were open. It seemed like a holiday. I myself was in the boudoir which gave onto the salon and whose door was also open. And so the child came to the world and the emperor said to Madame de Montesquieu, who received him, Madame de Montesquieu, what is it? Sire, you will know immediately. And the emperor took him in his arms before being arranged and showed him to everyone. The emperor came out into the salon and said, Gentlemen, tell them to fire 200 cannon shots. The emperor loved children greatly. He often asked for news of my son. One day I brought him down with me to the emperor's room. His majesty was there. He said to him immediately, Well, good, there you are. Good subject. He was at that time four years old and used a familiar form to address everyone and had no more timidity than anyone at his age. The emperor set him to the embrasure of the window and the child began straight away to touch his decorations and ask him about them. The emperor said to him, These things are only given to people who are well-behaved. And you, are you well-behaved? He opened his eyes wide straight away and said to him, Look me in the eye instead. I see here that a shield is a proud urchin. Shocked despite myself at how he was so familiar, I tried to signal him, but the emperor noticing made me turn my back and the child went on with his chatter better than ever. The emperor said to him, do you know how to pray to God? Yes, he said to him. I pray to him every day. The emperor said to him, What is your name? I am called Ashil Rustam, and you? I went up and said to him, That is the emperor. Hey, are you the one who hunts with Papa? His majesty asked me, Does he not know me? Sire, he has seen your majesty more often in hunting clothes. That is why he recognizes him less in these ones. The emperor tugged his ears, ruffled his hair. The child was enchanted, and it seemed that he had still many things to say to him. But his majesty said to him, I must go have breakfast. You will come see me again. I slept in the emperor's apartment. In the salon closest to his bedroom, a camp bed was set up for me every night during the time of the conspiracies. I had the idea of putting my bed across his door. One night, the emperor, instead of ringing for me, came into my room and opening the door, found himself blocked by my bed. He began to laugh greatly at my precaution. The following day, he told everyone and said, if anyone reaches me, it will not be Bruce Depp's fault because he has had the idea of barring my door with his bed. But I repeat, that was only during the time of the conspiracies. Usually, I would sleep in the center of the salon when the Grand Marshal found it more convenient to make a cabinet containing my bed, which pulled out when opening the two panels. It was a same clue where it was constructed and during a journey that we made, the Grand Marshal showed me this new invention, remarking to me that it would be neater and more practical. I gave in to these reasons and slept in my new bed. Chance again was that the Emperor came to look for me, not seeing a bed at all. After having made a tour of the salon, he came to my cabinet, choking with rage. He woke me very sharply. I did not know where I was anymore. And my first thought was that an evildoer had penetrated as far as him, and that I was about to jump out of bed to seize him when I recognized the emperor who heaped the rebuke, saying, Is this the way you guard me? I'm abandoned. I followed him into his room, seeking to explain himself, but he did not wish to listen to me. It was only on the following day when he was talking to me about this event that he began to laugh, saying that he had given me a great fright. It is true, sire. I tremble at it. When I think of it again, I believe that an, e I believe that an evildoer had got into your majesty's room or wanted to get in there. And I was on the point of seizing you to defend you. He told this catastrophe to the Empress Josephine, who appeared to feel very sorry for me, saying, that poor Rustam, he's so attached to you. And since yesterday, you have caused him so much grief. 
she had so great an affection for the emperor that she was fond of all those who bore him a true attachment. She became their protector. She often set right injustices and mellowed the emperor, whose character was rather violent. I owe it to her to have not been dismissed by the emperor more than once. Meanwhile, I was finally removed from riding on parade. I had not any use there it is true this was as it were an honorary duty but in truth for so many years i had accompanied him everywhere and i held that no one should infringe on my rights in such a way that i complained to the emperor that i was not wanted to ride on parade he said to me do not listen to them and still ride there he gave the order very imperatively and no one fought about it a little time after that, I was told that there were several sick horses, and so I was made to understand that I was using horses needlessly. I had to yield, not wanting to trouble the emperor with new complaints. Besides, I flattered myself that he would complain about my absence, but he closed his eyes to that and did not speak to me about it. The same attempts were made at the coronation, but vainly. The emperor had ordered two handsome outfits, which were tailored by two different embroiderers and each of them more brilliant than the other. One evening, he called me into the salon surrounded by several grand personages and gave me a dagger adorned with brilliant cut diamonds. It all seemed to me that I was to be in the procession, and I was far from thinking that anyone sought to oppose that. I therefore had perfect confidence when one day I went to check with Monsieur de Calencourt on the horse that he intended for me, he assured me affirmatively that I was not riding, that besides I should go to check with the Grand Marshal of Ceremonies who replied to me that there was no place, and that I should address myself to the Emperor. It was His Majesty who had assigned the places. I chose the dinner hour to ask the Emperor for permission to be in the procession. He answered me that without doubt, it was his intention and that he was authorizing me to go to the Grand Equerry to ask him for a handsome horse, but he persisted in telling me that he could not allocate me a place, and so I decided to implore the Empress for her support, fearing to fatigue the Emperor. She had the kindness to tell me she would speak about it with the Emperor, and that I should be present in the salon when coming out of dinner. At the moment when the emperor was taking his coffee, I turned up. Noticing me, he said to me, Will, what do you want? The emperor spoke up and said to him, This poor Rustem is highly upset. They want to prevent him from following you to Notre Dame. He who has shared your dangers, it is highly just that he be given this reward. The emperor said to me, Do you have a handsome outfit? I mentioned that I even had two of them. He said to me, go and get dressed so I can see you. I appeared the instant afterwards on his orders and shining like a sun. He found just as the empress, my outfit superb, and he had Mr. de Calencourt summoned to whom he gave the order to give me a horse and on the objection that a place could not be assigned to me because in a previous procession there had been no Mamelukes at all. The emperor answered him, he will be in every place. And I had the good fortune the following day to accompany the emperor even more satisfied because of the obstacles which had been thrown up. It was an attendant from the guard robe who for three days wore to break them in the shoes and boots of the emperor. His name was Joseph. The emperor was in Paris, 1811. The shoemaker was named Jacques. The emperor was getting dressed. His valet de chambre, his doctor were there. Look, sir, take my measurements. Yes, sir, you will be satisfied. How much are you going to make me pay for these shoes? 12 francs, sir. That is not expensive. What do you mean not expensive? Very expensive for some little shoes. For other customers, 13 francs. But to keep your custom, 12 francs. The shoemaker left, and the emperor said, What is that fellow's name? He is a true Frenchman. The shoes, not best fitting. Recourse had to be made to an attendant of the guard robe to break them in. Smorgoni, a Polish city with a reputation for taming bears during the retreat from Russia. His majesty arrived in this town, leaning on a great stick. It was dreadfully cold. The roads were so covered with snow. And with ice, the carriages could not be used. An hour after his arrival, he said to me, Stam, arrange everything in my carriage. We are going to depart. 
You are to ask Meneval for as much money as he can give you. Mr. Meneval gave me 60,000 francs in gold, which I put in his majesty's necessaire. I divided the seven thirds, a third in a compartment, another third in a vermeil chocolatier, and the rest in rolls in the false bottom. I closed the necessaire, whose key I kept. I put it in the carriage. During the journey, it was the Grand Equerry who paid the expense of the horses. I also put some provisions in the carriage, but they were of no use to us. Everything was frozen, and the flecons broke. During our departure... Everyone seemed worried and asked me what the emperor had just said to me. And so we departed at nine o'clock in the evening, escorted by three squadrons of the guard. The emperor had in his carriage the Grand Equerry. Marshal Duroc was in a sleigh with Lobau, myself at the front of the carriage with Vuncevich, a Polish officer who was serving as interpreter for the emperor. We arrived extremely late at the first post house. The third of the escort had stayed behind. I stepped down to relieve myself. I noticed a light in the small cabin very near to me. I entered to light my pipe. I saw several people lying on the straw. I recognized an officer of the gendarmerie of the guard who appeared astonished to see me and said to me, By what coincidence? I told him that the emperor was there. He said, what good fortune that he did not arrive here earlier. An hour ago, the Cossacks were here. They made an attack on the village. I got back onto the carriage, and we were back on the road, followed only by some poles. The remnants of three squadrons, the horses were falling down, and as a result, the riders were unseated. And at the second post house, we had no more of them. We reached Vilna. The emperor went through the Falbergs. There was a house a quarter of a league from that town on the road to France. The emperor stopped there and asked for the Duke de Bassano, who was in the town. He arrived an instant later and remained for a whole hour with the emperor, who ate a small amount because the provisions that were in the carriage were of no use at all. Monsieur Marais brought over six of his horses and his postillions to drive the emperor. We arrived in Covno at daybreak in a hotel run by a Frenchman. A large fire and a good breakfast were made for the emperor. We began to breathe, but we departed again soon. The first place where we stopped was a little burg where the emperor had lunch and changed his clothes. I had taken the precaution of bringing three changes. I left the dirty linen at the inn and gave it, not wanting to be overlooked, to the landlady of the inn immediately. Everyone divided it up into pieces. His majesty said to me to give some money to Calicor. And I went to get the chocolate tier. I asked him how much he wanted. The emperor then took it and emptied it into the Grand Equerry's hat. Who I requested to take note of the sum. He turned it onto a table and counted it. We abandoned the carriages which had left us in that place and we took some sleighs. The emperor got into a covered sleigh with the Grand Equerry, Marshal Duroc in another with the Polish officer, and me in a third with General Lefebvre and Denuet. That of the emperor went much faster, and we remained a half a day behind. But the emperor on his arrival had it written from the Grand Equerry to the Grand Marshal that on the reception of his letter, he would do whatever necessary to catch up with Rustem as soon as possible, as well as Vuncevich. The Grand Marshal arranged then for us to be given a lighter sleigh, but just the same, we were not able to arrive in Warsaw until the following day where we found His Majesty again. Emperor lunched there and received the city authorities, including, among others, the Archbishop of Moline. We departed still in the sleigh for Posen. We stopped off at a hotel where the Emperor again received the town authorities. Noticing me, the mayor said to me, Mr. Rustam, your face is frozen. I had not noticed this. Straight away, he sent for a flacon of liquor that he gave me, advising me to rub myself with it two or three times a day and to avoid, above all, going near the fire. I was frightened, starting to use it immediately. My skin turned as yellow as saffron, although the liquid was very clear. When I appeared before the Emperor's Majesty, cried out, What is the matter with you, Stan? What horror? I told him then that my face had become frozen. He likewise recommended that I not go near the fire, adding that my nose would fall off. The emperor dressed and received the king of Saxony, who made the observation to him that he would travel more comfortably in his carriages. But the emperor answered him that his slave permitted him to travel much faster. King added, poor Mr. Stem's face is all damaged. Some hours later, we saw the arrival of all those who had stayed behind. That is to say, the Grand Marshal, the Fabre de Nuet, the Polish officer, Etisse. We departed for Erfurt, passing through Dresden, where Monsieur de Saint-Aignan was ambassador. 
the emperor sent word to him to send his carriage to Erfurt, where the emperor stopped, washed, and dined. Afterwards, Monsieur de saint Agnès came to meet him there. With his carriage, the emperor got into it with the Grand Equerry, and we departed for Paris. At Mayence, we met Monsieur de Montesquieu, his majesty's adjutant. The emperor said to him, There you are, Montesquieu. You barely hurried. Pardon, sire, but what with this cold and the lack of horses? Come on, there's nothing wrong in that. We shall travel together. On our arrival in Mo, his majesty's carriage broke down, so the postmaster's cabriolet was taken, which the emperor got into with Monsieur de Calincourt, and ordering to me to get into another carriage with all his papers. Arrived before the iron gates of the Tuileries, the sentry blocked our entry. The emperor said to him, What's this rascal? You do not wish to let me enter my own home? He tugged his ears, and so finally recognized him. That evening, I helped his majesty undress. None of his valets de chambre had arrived. He then said to me, rest yourself for a few days, Rustam. Tell your father-in-law to come to me. The following day, while he was dressing, his majesty said to him, Rustam must be extremely tired. He needs to have an iron constitution. Two days later, I resumed my duties, and I came down in the morning for his dressing. Corvassar was present. My nose is as black as coal. The emperor told Mr. Corvisar to inspect my nose and asked him if there was any danger. After a thorough examination, Corvisar announced, No, sire, anyway. If it falls off, we shall fasten it on again. <laughs>